saturated fat. Many of us, me included, try to avoid eating them. Uh, saturated fat. A lot of saturated fat. Saturated fat. The true scientific research behind saturated fats. People have been warned for years about the dangers of eating too many saturated fats and the risks they pose for heart disease. So your Ansel Keys in the 1950s, middle-aged men seemingly healthy were dropping dead, and Americans need a solution. So you have a hypothesis, a hypothesis that you think will save millions from dropping dead of heart disease. After all, you're a physiologist and a biochemist. You know exactly how the body works, and you've seen how arterial plaque is made from cholesterol and is involved in heart disease. You also know that saturated fat is related to cholesterol. So you create the famous diet heart hypothesis that you think links saturated fat to heart disease. But there's just one problem. You need more evidence. You need to show that what you're talking about actually holds true across the world. So you take your test subjects and you start feeding them tons of cholesterol. But for some reason, no matter how much cholesterol you feed them, their levels in their blood just won't go up. So now you need a new way to trick. I mean, show the public that saturated fat and cholesterol are bad. The facts are simple. You know the chief killer of Americans is cardiovascular disease, disorders and degeneration of the heart and blood vessels. Here are vital statistics. They show that this problem here in America is the worst in the world. Your hypothesis has been proven, and with this newfound knowledge given to the public, you will now save millions of lives for people now opting for grain, sugar, and seed oil based foods that are very low in saturated fat. But there was just one issue. There was data available for 22 countries, but you already got everyone on board and your research funding relies on this hypothesis. So by 1961, the American Heart Association started to recommend that butter should be replaced with highly processed seed oils like margarine and that animal fats should be avoided so that we can all lower our cholesterol levels. Then by 1970, the United States Department of Agriculture, or the USDA, brought forward the food pyramid. You watch as the world embraces your low fat, high carb idea. The American Heart Association and the USDA are on board, reshaping the nation's diet, all based on your one extremely poorly designed study. You have now become the hero in the fight against heart disease. But as the 1970s rolled in, something's just not adding up. The nation following your guidance is cutting down on fats, yet health problems are escalating. Obesity rates are climbing, diabetes is spreading, and heart disease is still a leading cause of death. People are questioning the narrative, but you're too deep in. Your study has influenced millions. Retracting now would be admitting to an unforgivable mistake. Your influence is undeniable. Doctors, nutritionists, and even the government have bought into the low-fat ideology. The food industry is turning out low-fat products, and your hypothesis has become a self-fulfilling prophecy. Here's new Kellogg's low-fat granola bar. All that crunchy granola, but only half the fat of the leading crunchy granola bar. Kellogg's low-fat granola bars? Mmm. Hey! These are good! But let's give Ansel the benefit of the doubt here. Let's say there is a clear correlation, and we can go based on his extremely poorly designed seven-country study. Well, first off, correlation doesn't equal causation. Just because something is correlated, does that mean that was the thing that caused it? In Canada where I live, there seems to be a lot of ambulances wherever there is a medical emergency. Does that mean the ambulances caused the medical emergencies? Well, of course not. So now we know that correlation doesn't mean causation, and these two things can be completely unrelated. But this isn't the only issue with an observational study of this kind. For starters, surveying people on what they eat can be extremely inaccurate. For most people who eat a wide variety of foods, it can be extremely difficult to guess how much of what food was eaten over weeks, months, or even years. This leads to my next point, confounding factors. Confounding factors are other factors that come into play that could affect the data. For example, if you ask someone how much meat they ate in the past week and then strictly base results on the amount of meat and nothing else, you don't account for all of the different ways that meat could have been eaten. Was it in a double cheeseburger from McDonald's? Was it a hot dog from Costco? Or was it just a full ribeye on its own with maybe a bit of salt? But it's not just the food, there are also lifestyle factors. Are people who eat more meat also more likely to smoke? Are they more likely to not exercise, etc.? 
As you can see, the results get muddied very quickly. And this is why it's so crazy to think that we could base the entire food pyramid in heart healthy recommendations based on this data. If anything, this data should have made it very clear that we didn't know exactly what caused these diseases and that we needed to do far more research before we came to any conclusions. And what makes this even crazier is after all these recommendations were put into place and diseases skyrocketed even further, we still fall back on these recommendations to this day. Public schools in Brooklyn, we will be instituting Meatless Mondays. Now I'm not saying there's some global conspiracy and they're trying to make everyone sick, but let's just think about the incentives here. Nowadays, many of the nutritional studies that follow many of these same flawed parameters as the 7 countries study are funded by giant corporations like Nestle and Coca-Cola. They also have no obligation to publish certain studies if they go against their agenda. So how likely is it that these big corporations that make billions off selling processed foods that are grain and carb based, which are perfectly aligned with the bulk of the food pyramid, have our best interests in mind. After all, over 70% of Americans at this point are either overweight or obese. This is one of the main reasons why nutrition seems to be so complicated nowadays. So many people are pushing flawed studies that they draw conclusions from which should have never even been considered in the first place. Now you might be wondering, okay, well how do we properly control these studies then? Well, we can't. To have a properly controlled study, you would have to lock two twins in a lab from birth and control every single aspect of their being to ensure that they are all the same. Obviously, we can't do this. We've been looking in the wrong place, and when you look in the wrong place, you're going to get the wrong answers. The questions that we should be asking are, what foods are we meant to consume? What is our physiology designed for? If we've eaten something for the majority of our evolution, it is most likely going to be perfectly in line with our physiology. Do you really think highly processed seed oils that have just recently sprung into existence are going to be metabolized better in our bodies than say something like fatty red meat, which we have eaten for millions of years? It's highly unlikely. But now you might say, okay, but our ancestors only lived till like 35. But this is mostly because most babies died at birth drastically reducing the average lifespan. And we do have the longest life expectancy ever recorded now. This is because our medical system has had some amazing breakthroughs allowing us to dramatically reduce mortality of newborns. But although our life expectancy is longer than ever, we are also sicker than ever. We are alive, but we are unwell. We need to get back to our roots of eating primarily fatty red meat from large ruminant animals. 